All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome. We are recording this from Vegas after Master Worlds. Both. Yeah. Josh and I have competed. Yeah. Sadly, both lost. Josh won his first match. Lost his second. I won my. I lost my first match. Um, but we're here to talk about we'll recap it actually. And if you yeah. have not listened to the uh, the Master Worlds episode that was released prior to this weekend, then it may be helpful to go back and listen to that because it will give you a little bit more insight into our mindset going into this weekend, uh, what we're looking to take away from it, and how we're approaching each match. Yeah. Cool. Um, Josh, talk to me about your, talk to me about your two matches. What'd you learn? What went, what went well? What went what didn't go the way you expected? Just talk to me about that. Yeah. So I had two matches. You saw both of them. Um, my first match, this was my first tournament at Purple Belt. Uh, Master one, lightweight. So I went up a belt and then he just moved slowly. I went up a belt and then um, also up a weight class. So I normally do like feather for, or for the past two years I was doing feather for majors. So up a weight class, up a belt level. And uh, my first match, I got an ankle lock. And that's the, for anybody who doesn't know, that's the like main submission I've got over the past couple years. I. Also have an ankle lock tattoo. I think I've got like 80 something in competition at this point. I shortchanged you a little bit when I was talking to uh, Aman, we were, we were there and he was uh. like, man, that thing is slick. I was like, well, yeah, if you hit like 50 of them in competition, he was like, he was like it's oh, yeah. about 50, huh? I was, like, I was like, I'm pretty sure. Times two. Times two, almost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it was um, it was cool to like try to implement that same game that I've been doing at Blue Belt for for that amount of time in the Purple Belt division. So it was like, because obviously I've never competed at Purple Belt, so I'm like wondering how different is it going to be. That's the main question. Um, <clears throat> so it was cool that that uh, like old reliable worked. Are you looking at the audio waveforms? I'm looking at it, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. That the uh, old reliable uh, was working. And then uh, second match, I lost that one two to two. Um, I swept him, he swept me. Uh, he got some like advantages throughout the match, so that's how he ended up winning. Um, like overall, uh, I think the main like theme of of going into this was what is it like moving up from like one belt level to the next belt level how big is the jump mm -hmm. like people talk about how big is the jump from white to blue belt and then the next question is like how much is the jump from blue to purple and then like so on and um i would say like the the purple belt j literally just out a sample size of two in the masters division also um just out of that sample size it just seemed like it was uh, just taking sort of what the top of the blue belt division was and then like putting like like, uh, like everybody's like that or yeah everybody kind of is kind of yeah. around that level yeah. or higher i yeah. guess yeah and um that was the main thing um it was kind of a confidence booster to like be like okay i don't feel like i'm in unfamiliar territory mm -hmm. uh so that was cool and um i lost and i wanted to win six matches and get gold but, you know, that's not up to me. So I can, you know, I came to, you know, do my best and put the most effort I could into the matches. And I did that. And I learned a bunch of shit, so. What did you learn? Um, some jujitsu stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned. Yeah, there was like, um, it's the same thing with every match. that Like every competition match I've, I've ever done, you always get hit with like a slightly new thing. You know, it, it can be close to what something you've experienced before or it's like entirely new and this time i got hit with lapel stuff and nobody at blue belt's doing lapel stuff at least like not well that i ever encountered i don't think anybody ever did anything by wrapping a lapel around my leg and this guy did that um and uh and then he had some other in the second match he had some um just yeah cool little tricks like coming up from uh, a double pull 
uh, looking for side control from like this crazy dog position. It's just things that you you don't see at the you know at the lower level and yeah, just more awareness, more tactics. I didn't feel like outstrength or outmatched necessarily. I felt out tactics and out un, out awared and <laughs> like the, those types of things rather than just being like when I first started competing at Blue Belt, it just felt like I was in like a fluster of like mm -hmm. chaos, not knowing anything that was happening. And I was like very in the moment in the matches and, and so it was good, but cool. yeah. Was there anything you feel we had been working on leading up to this that you were able to apply or something that you wish you were able to apply that you didn't get to? Yeah, um, really I think uh, uh, in large part in that second match because there were uh, a number of good sequences where he was trying to pass and that's where he got the advantages from was from those passing attempts. And we've been like training, just following the constraints led approach and literally just the concepts of like, keep my feet in front of me, like keep my feet in front of him. That just like saved everything the entire time. Like, that, like at no point w um, was I lost for how to retain guard. If I just thought the whole time, how can I move my body in any way that's gonna get my feet back in front of him? And I did that and he, w he wasn't able to pass. Um, and, um, I mean, you can, it, it all depends on like how much of that is like the approach we took to training versus him specifically and like how much, you know, just how, how that match played out or whatever. So there's all these different variables and everything, but I definitely felt that. Um, I didn't feel um, like in danger or that I was like, didn't know what my like task focus should be basically. And then um, the other thing I think Actually, same thing in all those matches, just from guard, like being doing whatever I can to like keep my feet in front of them if I wasn't in like single leg X or whatever. Yeah. And um, the the only thing that I wish I would have been able to work on or do in that match was because um, I was in that crazy dog position myself as well and I wasn't able to like finish that pass. But um, but yeah, we'll just like work that and yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no excuses. No sad stories. I'm trying to say all like the, <laughs> all, the, the all the common tropes. Yeah, yeah. all the tropes. <laughs> yeah, no sad stories here. No sad stories. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. Tell me about tell me about your match. Yeah, yeah. um, <clears throat> this is the first time that I competed at a tournament this big. Uh, last year, if you guys go back and listen to the original or the the first. Uh, episode surrounding Master Worlds, you'll hear the story. But last year I didn't get to, was injured. This year, super pumped to be here. Um, I lost, I lost on points. I lost 12 nothing, but it didn't feel like a 12 nothing match. Uh, I say that because despite falling into some pretty bad positions, I think I got out of them really, really well. Uh, and very quickly too. And very quickly. Yeah. Like, yeah. If there were any points scored, it was like points scored and then I was out. It wasn't yeah. like I was stuck. Yeah. Um, well, it only takes three seconds to score points, right? right? Exactly. And so yeah. I think the reason the score, I think the reason the score got run up so hard is because I was behind, I had to take chances. And because I took chances, I there were things with, that I got caught with. Like, yeah when you have to take chances you're just you open yourself up for things like that yeah for That's, context you were like down on points and then there was like a situation where time's running out like keep in mind the the masters matches like you're ma you had a six minute yeah. match right yeah i had a six minute match um it's uh it's not it, that not that much time to yeah. to do stuff yeah and once you fall behind yeah it, it becomes it's a different game yeah uh, it's like it's a challenge it's a different challenge than you would see at at like the adult level where matches are seven, eight, nine minutes. So or 10 minutes of black belt, yeah. Black belt. yeah. So, um, you know, I went down on points. I saw an opportunity to go for submission. I went for it. I ended up getting passed and I'm down a little bit more. Yeah. I get, I retain my guard, same way, like exactly what we were talking about. Just thinking about get my feet back in front, get my feet back in front, like not thinking about specifics like where do i put what when how yeah. but more so just like how by whatever means necessary yeah. get my feet back in front yeah. so i was able to you know get my guard back and then yeah. threaten from the guard and like yeah. i was i felt i was 
despite losing twelve nothing, I think I had more. I had more submission attempts for sure. I think yeah. I had three or four, yeah. um, where I was like threatening hard, uh, and just wasn't able to seal it. It is what it is. Like you said, I learned a lot. Um, you know, there's some scenarios that I had never encountered before. Like I, I knew he wanted to pull, but I didn't know he wanted to pull deep half so quickly. <laughs> that was a little surprising because people don't normally do that. And then yeah, who pulls deep half? <clears throat> yeah, just, besides Bernardo Faria. Right. <laughs> and so I was a little, I was a little, um, you know, I, I felt at least leading up to this like pretty confident in my ability to stuff deep half. But he got there really quickly, and that's like all props to my opponent. Uh, he was very, very clearly looking for that position, and he did it. He did it skillfully, um, and I wasn't able to execute the like the counter that I that I would typically do in training. Um, and then the other thing that I saw that I wasn't prepared for was was also the lapel stuff, and it was a different lapel configuration than. I'm used to. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying not to swallow uh, into the mic. That's okay. Josh drinking claws. Yeah, uh, for the purposes of YouTube monetization, I'm not. <laughs> but you would, you would never know. Yeah. There's no way to confirm that, actually. Right. You yeah. can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah, the contents of that cup. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was the lapel thing. Yeah, it was a, it was a strange lapel configuration that I had never seen before. Um, he didn't, it wasn't like a, like a typical worm guard where you like wrap the far leg, you're actually wrapped the near leg and yeah, he's just using it to like sit up. And yeah. Like, I was like very perplexed by that. Uh, and trying to break that grip, he was able to bump me and, and bumping me, he was able to get back to his deep half, which led to another sweep. And, um, so yeah, but I mean, despite all of that, I was present the whole match. I never felt again, out strength. I never felt. Like I didn't know what was going on, even if I had not seen that particular, uh, that configuration or that iteration of deep half, I was like very much able to think my way through the problems and get myself out of bad positions. Yeah. Um, so I'm proud of myself for number one, executing some of the things that we've been working on. Number two, doing some things that I've never done in the competition before. I can count on maybe one hand how many times I've actually got a kipping escape from the mount, yeah. and I did it, and it was that was that was kind of cool. Um, and you know, as far as like things that I want to take from this, just like we'll go back to the training room and um, you know go back to those those positions that maybe were a little unfamiliar and work from there and try to get better at them. So next time they happen, it's not as surprising. Yeah. To be able to stuff it. Yeah. Yeah. What did you, so I coached Matt, I, yeah, I don't know how much you would say it was actual coaching versus like, what did, what did you think of how the, the coaching, whatever I was yelling at you, how no, did that? I loved it. It yeah. was uh, really, really helpful. All, all of the cues were helpful. There was no like puppeteering, which is like really, really common for anybody watching this. I'm sure you've seen or heard. Maybe you do it yourself. I don't know. Uh, you know, trying to like force an athlete to do the thing that you're saying. Put your foot here now at this. You know, at this speed. Like it gets. It gets really, really. And actually, right before you were going, there was the, the match right before you is your first match. Were they doing that? Oh my goodness! Yeah. I was like, this poor guy is like trying so hard to do the thing that you want him to do, but he just can't. Right. Because, you know. The thing that really gets me, and this is like, if you all have listened to the show long enough, you've heard me like call back to um, experiences that I've had in coaching hockey, and they teach us coach on the bench, not from the bench, because there's no way, despite my ability to see what's going on on the ice or the mats in this case, there's no way for me to know exactly what's going on, because you're the one who's like taking in. The, you're, t you're taking in the environment. I can't feel the other guy. I can't feel the kind of pressure he's putting. I can't feel the grip or whatever, vice versa. Like when I was on the mat and you're coaching me, you have no clue. Yeah. Like you don't know what, what the environment's actually like. Yeah, I think it's very arrogant of anybody also to like assume that they... Right, yeah, despite, no, yeah. you know, even if, even if they've been there a thousand times, 
they ha- still haven't been there right in this one spot it's always different yeah. right it's yeah. always different it's always going to be a little bit different right like the guy i'm going against might be a, you know might have longer legs or longer arms than you know whoever my coach is referring back to in their own brain like okay i remember this this is what you do because it's, it's just not like that so the cues you're using super helpful they were specific enough to refocus me if I needed it, but broad enough not to, number one, come off as too prescriptive, and number two, give away what it is that I wanna do, which is another one of my main gripes with that kind of coaching, is like, you're telling the other guy what, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. put the lapel here, put the lapel like, yeah. okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I always wonder, like, I, I always wonder if coaches think about that and it's, you know, maybe that's a hot take. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's something that I definitely have learned in my own experience coaching yeah. and being coached. It's, it's not my favorite way to be coached. Yeah. For, for reference. So, cause we train with the constraints led approach and usually the way that we're training is simply by having like a goal or a task focus for a specific situation. And so when we're, when we're training, we're only training specific situations, right? We're putting like more or less strengths around a scenario. So like our beginning and end of that scenario is gonna be much more constrained than a live role. But within that live role, um, uh, it, so a competition match, for example, you're gonna run into hopefully many of those same scenarios that you trained. And so you have some idea of what your goal in that situation should be and you have a variety of like things that you should focus on in order to accomplish that goal. So like when we're training, if, um, if we're on bottom and guard, one goal a lot of the time, or rather um, a task focus in order to, to accomplish a variety of things is keeping your feet in front of your opponent who's on top. So one of the things that I was yelling out, for example, was not like, t- uh, assuming that I can tell Matt how to do like a technique or anything like that, but rather just like trying to provide supplementary information to what he's already experiencing and feeling. Right. It's like, um, I think the idea is to like supplement, um, it, supplement you with like um, uh, where you should place your, they call it the intention and attention, but basically provide you supplement, supplementary information about something that might be helpful for you to focus on in that situation right and like you might already be doing that thing too right right yeah. and like if you are then like cool and then if you're not um then like maybe it's the right thing to do but also maybe not right, right. and and then you can like and do something me, else like, yeah take that information and be like okay is this the right thing right and either do it or not or whatever but yeah I guess so like, it's very simple cues. So yeah. like a lot of the times I was yelling like hands, 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 hands. Like when Matt was like in his opponent's back control for like what was it, like 10 seconds maybe. Like you started, you were pe- peeling, peeling the hands, hands off, right? right? Like Which that. you were doing that already. Right. And like, yeah. Right. But it like, yeah, in, in that moment just justifies what is that I'm doing. I'm like, okay, like I yeah. feel like I'm on the right track here. Right. Um, so, yeah. And I, I mean, I think, I think one of the main, I guess, you know, I, I mentioned coaching on the bench, not from the bench. In hockey, you have the opportunity to, like, talk to people in the middle of the period, right? Like, if the period is 20 minutes, you know, a player goes out, they go off for 45 seconds to a minute, and they come back, and you can be like, hey, okay, this is what I saw. What did you see? And you can have a discussion about it, and then try to figure out, okay, next time I see that scenario, what would I do? And then the player can kind of, like, you know, you can, it's more of a discussion versus in jiu-jitsu, you don't really have that opportunity unless it's between matches. Right. Right, you CJI. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or CJI. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess that's that's maybe the main difference here is that there isn't. Uh, it's less of a conversation and more of it's. I guess more of a one-way street as far as coaching cues. But all that to say, I thought the coaching cues that you were giving were really uh, pertinent, poignant. I don't know if that's the right word, but just on point. Everything made sense uh, as you were saying it. I I felt. I felt seen. I felt heard. <laughs> I was like, "Yes, okay, this this all makes sense," and I don't feel like I am. I don't feel like I need to. Uh, you know, the whole time I didn't think I didn't think of one single technique. Yeah. I I wasn't like, okay, I need to do this here. I was solely thinking of the task foci that we've been, you know, training around. Right. Uh, whether that was get the feet off me or 
you know, get my feet in front of him or strip the hands or, you know, any of those things. Like, and whatever I needed to do to get that, I did it. And that's something that I'm really proud of. So. Yeah, you, yeah. Um, I think like we've all had this experience, I think most people have, is where you just feel frustrated being coached by somebody. And I think that's not something to get over. I think, in fact, that's actually the opposite. It's like a signal that maybe that the method of coaching is not the optimal method of coaching. Right. <laughs> right. Because yeah. like it, you could say, well, if I'm frustrated, it's just because I'm not like listening enough to the coaching or I'm not like right. um, something something else is wrong other than like the method of coaching, mm-hmm. like the and specifically talking about like the prescriptive prescript prescriptive coaching yeah half a claw and i'm already (laughs) not a claw for the purposes of youtube monetization (laughs) um but like when when like if you've ever been in a match and somebody's like yelling out for you to like take your right hand and put it there power prop on your elbow at 90 degrees and do this and this and you're trying to like take that information in and process it and then like do and like it just um like most of the time I don't think that works and it's very, um, and not only is like the baseline of it mostly not working, I think, um, not only that, but it can also pour over into just being very frustrating, trying to figure out how to like do what they're telling you to do. And, um, especially if you're, if you're French and you're coaching and you're, and you're coaching your, your student in French, and I'm standing next to you just feeding the other person exactly what you're saying. Yeah, well, that was, when was that? That was last year, it was yeah, a year ago. Yeah. That was a year ago, because I had one of yeah, my- Yeah, that was the previous Master yeah, World, too. That was, I had one of my athletes who was in, he was in the finals match, and the, the, other, the other guy was from, I think he was from Algeria or Tunisia, um, somewhere there in, in North Africa, maybe Morocco. And his coach was coaching him in French, telling him exactly what to do, where to put his hands, where to do this, where to do this. And I just like take it and like, hey, Pete, he's going to do this. Watch his right hand. He's going to put it on your collar. And he got so frustrated. It was it was a blast. So anyways, if you're a coach, please don't do that because it just gives away everything that you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prescriptive coaching, I think, can and does work in like certain situations. And I've actually experienced it myself, like one of my matches in Atlanta when I was in there, because uh, my my team, for, for those who don't know, which I don't expect you to know, but my, my team is in Atlanta Odyssey Jiu-Jitsu, and I was out there doing the Atlanta Open a, a few months ago. And like my coach Greg told me I was in a like half guard or half butterfly on top, something like that. And he was telling me to long step past it. And he said, hey, okay, make sure you pin his leg with your left foot. And I did that and it worked and it works. And like, yeah. so like, I think in like certain situations. Okay. Um, it's interesting too. Yeah, it's like, but I think it's, I think it's most of the time, I think it's very contextual. Most of the time prescriptive coaching does not work and can be detrimental. Mm-hmm. But I have seen instances where I've like seen a coach tell somebody to do a specific thing right, and like right. they're able to do that. Yeah. But, I, but I feel like those are more exceptions rather than, um, yeah, it's exceptions that only works in certain contexts. I was also in like a very dominant sort of passing position. So it's easier to execute on like the specific thing. And like, what if the thing didn't actually end up working? Cause like the guy responded in a different way. It's like, right, right. Um, yeah, not, not, that's not a hit on Gr- Greg's coaching either. Actually, in fact, um, even when uh, Greg, like Aman was coaching me today, um, and um, they actually give very like attentional focused cues yeah. as well. Yeah, like no, Aman's like, yelling at me to keep my feet in front yeah. and like all this kind of stuff. So yeah. like, I think like even if you're not training with the constraints led approach or whatever, it's it's now it's still also a question just about like coaching in general right, right? rather than like is this like the constraints that approach way of coaching no i think it's a a, a question of what is good it's coaching like human communication yeah really. yeah, uh, yeah and for anybody who's wondering the the book that i recommend on this is the language of coaching which i think somebody recommended to you recently maybe the, the language yeah. of coaching is by nick winkleman in any case uh if you're curious about how to coach people and uh develop skills and um, you know, get them to do the things that you or they want to do in order to get better at sports or just life in general, then that's a great book. It's a great read. Um, really well worth the time and effort to get through that one. Um, and then the, I guess the last thing I'll say on that thing that you said that stuck out 
was being in a dominant position, I think it's way easier to execute prescriptive cues mm -hmm. if you're the one who's in charge. <laughs> if you're like yeah. under somebody in their mount and somebody's yelling at you to get out and put your leg here or whatever, it's just like so much harder, I feel. I, I, I've been in that position, I think we all have at least one, once or twice, yeah. where somebody's telling you what to do and you're just like, can't like <laughs> he doesn't want me to yeah i just literally cannot <laughs> do the thing that I you're tried. telling me to do and and so that i think like we said it's contextual so um you know i'm not not saying that it never works i'm certain that there have been times where somebody's been in a bad position and a coach gave a you know a prescriptive cue and then the person did it and it got out and it was like wow it really saved me the match uh but I think by and large, yeah, those are exceptions yeah, for sure. For yeah, for sure, an exception. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, uh, do you want to wrap that here? That's thirty minutes of yeah, yeah. We'll wrap it here as a good little yeah. little segment on yeah. our experience with uh, coaching. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> I was gonna say more, but yeah, you All guys right. just watched. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. If you found this useful, like, comment, subscribe, follow us on Instagram, follow us on uh, TikTok. And if you found this useful, share it with somebody that you know. Thanks for the roll. Thanks for the roll. Pew.